So welcome everyone for, to this UKRI webinar this afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Mike uh, Snazner, joining us from the JAX Lab, who's going to be giving us a really great overview of recent research highlights and updates from the Model AD Consortium. And Mike's really kindly also agreed to kind of particularly update us on where we are with the new towel knocking models, which I know will be of interest to many of us uh, within the Institute. So over to you, Mike. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to give this talk. Um, I'm talking about, um, as Francis said, the, the Model AD initiative, but I have other um, projects I can talk about and I'll just kind of briefly survey those and then I'm, I'm happy to take questions or talk at another time um, about those other projects. I will be at ADP next week. So if, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to follow up there as well. Um, so, Overview, I'm really going to focus on model AD, which is late onset Alzheimer's disease mouse models. I'll talk about mouse model development and then some of the environmental factors we're, we're putting into play. I won't talk about genetic diversity, although obviously we know that's really important. I just I had six or eight slides and I figured I wouldn't have time for them, but I, I would like to talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, as Francis said, I'll, I'll focus on some humanized tau models that are in development and some other humanized loci we're working on. And then I'll talk about the phenotyping we're doing and the resources we're making available and then the, um, the preclinical testing that's going on. If we have time, I'll mention some familial AD models as well as some, some neuroimmune mod models. And at the end, I'd like to talk about one training opportunity. So just one slide of introduction to JAX. Our, uh, our corny mission statement is to discover precise genomic solutions for disease and empower the global biomedical community in the shared quest to improve human health. So I'm really gonna focus today on that empowering the global community. This is not a, a typical research talk. I'll be talking about the resources that we're developing. And really, I'm excited to give this talk because you guys are our key audience. We're, we're generating mouse models that we want the world to use and the world to use to um, develop new diagnostics and therapeutics. So you are, you are a really a core audience and um, I'm really excited to be able to present this to you and, I, and I'm happy to follow up with you later in, in whatever, whatever format. Um, just to mention, the JAX also has a strong education program. I'll, I'll mention one um, course where it's relevant at the end. And in terms of resources, you you know us as a mouse business. We're, we're actually a not-for-profit. Um, we have the largest mouse repository in the world. And all the revenue from the mouse business go back into the mouse business. So the, the mouse you're buying today is, is helping to fund the mouse we're importing that you're going to buy next year. And then we also have um, a large number of databases that are available for the global community, mouse gene informatics, gene expression, mouse phenotype, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of Alzheimer's disease, this is an old slide. This is really a starting point for model AD. Um, we've been studying transgenic models of familial AD for, for decades. And you know, other than some, some very recent successes, we, we've had failure after failure. And there's lots of reasons for that, and some of those are debatable, and, and some of those are obvious. But um, the NIA decided six or seven years ago now that we need to do something different. So um, instead of you know having models just based on European populations, instead of using transgenes, instead of having models that were made by one institution and were legally restricted for um, for biotech and pharma, um, most of those models did not have robust neurodegeneration. They're focused on early onset AD. And all of those were pretty much on, on black six background. So the reproducibility of the findings from, from mouse to human was, was very poor. And we're basically tasked with, with trying to improve that. Um, you've all seen this. This is actually a decade old now almost, but you're all aware that there are a very few number of rare mutations which cause Alzheimer's disease, but the vast majority of Alzheimer's genetic risk resides in these low risk, relatively common alleles. Um, so greater than 95% of patients do not have those familial causative mutations. They have some combination of these relatively common, relatively low risk. Um, large percentage of these are expressed in microglia, and a large percent of genetic risk is actually non-coding variants. So that, that makes our lives difficult in terms of how do we model this, this genetics. So the Model AD program was set up to um, take the clinical data we have um, genetics and genomics from human populations, neuropath, neuroimaging, fluid biomarkers, and then use that to design a mouse model that would better model the human condition. Um, and critically, I want to emphasize, we're phenotyping these 
in ways that are translationally relevant. We're doing the same omics, we're doing the same neural path, same vehicle imaging, same biomarkers. So that allows us to have much more confidence in this mouse model correlates to this form of human disease, as opposed to just putting a mouse in a water bath and, and seeing if it swims right and saying, okay, this is, we're curing Alzheimer's disease. So um, we're really focused on quantitative translational phenotypes. And then those can then be used to, to pick a model that we can then use for, for drug testing. So uh, just summarize, establish and implement guidelines for rigorous phenotyping and preclinical testing in, in late onset AD models. Um, and really we're, we're modeling these on um, clinical trials, not academic. Uh, research. We're aligning the complex data sets from the models to humans to better inform model development, characterization, and utility for clinical drug studies. And really, essentially, the point of this talk, we're providing a resource for standardized therapeutic efficacy testing of preclinical drug candidates. Um, we're, we're <laughs> based on NIA's guidance, we're focused on um, largely on the pharma biotech audience, but obviously, these models were, were going to be very important for, for academic research as well. And my, there we go. So uh, we have a bioinformatics core led by Greg Carter here at, at JAX. Um, he's taken human genetics and identifying which variants we should put into mouse models. Here you see a large number of, of risk variants we've put in mouse models. We're doing multi-omic comparisons to human transcriptomic modules. And then we're doing pathway analysis and um, digging down and understanding how they relate to, to human Alzheimer's disease. And I want to I want to emphasize here, we're going to focus on we're making dozens of bites. We're going to focus on a relatively small number that we're going deeper and deeper phenotyping and later phenotyping. That doesn't mean these other models are not of value. Um, we think all of these models will have some research application if you're studying a specific pathway, a specific um, um, gene expression pathway that these, these should be relevant. But we're going to screen a large number and then focus on a relatively small, small number. So. Initially, we prioritized the late onset risk variants based on um, they had to have significance in multiple studies. They had to have a predictive predict effect on function. We want to see differential expression in Alzheimer's disease. And we really wanted to, to look at diverse mechanisms. So down here on the bottom right, you know, there's we can group these risk variants in whether vascular or, or metabolic or synaptic or immune or, or lipid. Uh, we didn't want to have the vast majority in, in one of these groups. So we, we made a conscious effort to have um, at, at least a couple of hits in each of these different um, pathways with the idea that maybe down the road, we would be combining a hit in immune, hit in lipid, and hit in vascular and make a, a multi-allele model that could be more, more closely modeled human condition. Initially, we focused on those risk variants that were conserved. Um, I'll, I'll get into later how we're, we're getting around that because like I said before, most of the um, the risk variance is not in um, coding regions, but in, in uh, non-coding regions, which are largely not as conserved. And we, we chose to pick different types of alleles, largely risk SNPs, but there also there are some lots of function models. We just did the, the simple knockout. Initially, these are made on what we're calling a load one background. It's a black 6J background with an APOE4 humanized allele and the trim to R47H allele. And this is published um, Kevin Catrides. For, for those models where we're going deeper, we've actually added a humanized A beta allele, and we're calling that load too. Um, just to remind me to say, we're kind of drawing a distinction here between risk variants and these, um, what I think of as necessary but not sufficient variants. Um, we know APOE4 has, has strong genetic risk, but it's not causative in most cases. Um, we know that humanized A beta or APP is more neurotoxic than mouse. Um, and we know that, that human and mouse tau are expressed in, in very different ways. So um, we made a real effort to humanize these loci, but we're not considering these so these models. We're considering these are base models and we're adding risk variants on top of those. And this is just remind me to say that, you know, we all know this, but we don't always act on it. Age is the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. When I see someone doing an uh, experiment in a, in a 5X fad mouse at, you know, six months of age, this is essentially a human that's the 20 to 30 years of age. So you're studying amyloid, you're studying neuroinflammation, but I, I would argue you're not studying Alzheimer's disease. 
So we are doing our um, initial screening out to tw at 12 months, just for practical reasons, but we are taking mice to 24 months and later um, just to, to get that aging component. So this is the, the set of models we created to date, uh, just as grouped by, we have some, uh, we made a humanized day beta, the UCI Model AD Center made a flux humanized day beta, we have the allelic series of APOE, we have an allelic series of TREM2, and these polygenic load models that I mentioned. Um, as I said, we started with coding variants, largely SNPs, and these are all, um, either we have data for these or we, were, we are generating data this summer. Um, so by the fall, we will have at least transcondomic data on all of these. We're also now focusing on some of these non-coding variants, um, and we will have data on those later this year. All of these are available today. Um, happy to have you ad adopt these and start using them, but we don't have um, publications or, or even data on some of these yet. And I should mention the, the UC Irvine uh, Model AD Center also has a, a set of models. Um, uh, a beta knocking, as I mentioned, and then some some coding and, and a few non-coding variants. So these these will be of interest as well. I want to take a slight divergence here and talk about um, the avail availability of these models. Um, as you probably know, the the field has been limited by legal restrictions or um, saying you can't crossbreed these mice or or whatever. Um, our funding agencies, National Institute of Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, and various foundations have, <laughs> they agree with us that, that we should not have restrictions on those. I don't know if they came to Jax because that's our, our ethic anyway, or that was a, um, a point in our favor. But anyway, we all agree there should be no restrictions on use for any of these models that, that we're talking about today. Farm and biotech use is allowed. Crossbreeding is allowed. Um, the one exception I should note is that models made with CRISPR technology are under a CRISPR broad license. Therefore, internally, even companies can do anything they want. They just can't use those models to provide a service unless they get an agreement from Bro to Caribou and Caribou. Uh, models are made available as soon as is practical. And as you're probably aware, the normal process to, is someone will make a mouse, characterize it, publish it, and then send it to JAX. And um, the mouse is well characterized upon JAX receiving it and distributing it. That is not the case here. We are making those available. Um, as soon as we can practically do it. And just the side note here, if you're making models, we'd, we'd love to have you consider sharing those models that you have developed through JAX. So I just want to run through the, the timeline of, of these experiments quickly. Um, so we're, we're using CRISPR in most cases. We're breeding a couple generations. Um, we're doing cryo and rederiving into high health status. And then we generate a colony. That's you know uh, more than a year and a half or so right there. For our research, we're generating complex genotypes, so that takes some breeding. We're creating cohorts, takes some more breeding, aging cohorts, that takes a year or two if we're doing a 24-month study. Um, then, of course, you need to, to acquire the data, analyze data, write a paper, and we all know the publication process is, um, is not quick. So these, these projects can take you know, four to six years, um, which is <laughs> horrifying. We think you start today, you published in 2029. Um, so these are projects that can't be done in a typical, typical grant cycle or a typical grad student postdoc career timeline. I would, I would hate to be a grad student whose advisor gave him a, a five-year project um, before you got any data at all. So we, we feel fortunate that we have funding. We can do these things. Um, and how we're trying to help the community is we're publicizing what we're making as we're making it. So you can be aware that, you, you know, if you're really interested in a specific model, if you come to us and we tell you, you we are making it already, you can plan on getting that down the road. Um, as I said, we're making the mites available as soon as we can, which is even before we've generated aging cohorts, even before we've done the characterization. Um, where we have data, like for a 12 month old cohort, we'll make that data available in some cases, we're publishing that even at 12 months before we get the 24 month data. And um, I'll show you later, we're making the data available online before we have a bioarchive paper or before we publish, we're making the data available online as we acquire it, basically. So you don't have to wait the five years to see the at least the, the initial, initial data because we're making it available um, publicly. Uh, we routine, routinely provide letters of support for grant applications. So if you know we're making a mouse, I don't know about you, but our grant application process generally takes a, a year to 18 months or whatever anyway. 
So if we're making a mouse, by the time you you're, you get the funding in your hand, we will have the mouse available for you to use. So we're happy to provide those layers of support. Um, and in some cases, we'll have data, at least preliminary data online that you could even leverage and you know draw a graph from our data and put that in grant application. Where practical, we will provide breeding pairs from our research colonies for labs to do complementary phenotyping. We don't want to be replicating effort, but and we would greatly appreciate if people would share the data when they do that. But just for example, if we're generally doing bulk RNA-seq on, on half grains, homogenates. If someone's interested in doing single cell RNA-seq, we would be happy to, to share tissues where we have them available. And finally, we provide homo homozygous complex genotypes. You don't want to get a mouse and spend the next 18 months generating a, a, a mouse that has three or four alleles. Hopefully, we'll be able to provide that for you, and you can start uh, on day one. I also want to touch on the cryopreservation issue, because this is a, always a, a question. Um, JEX currently has more than 13,000 distinct strains available and over 1,500 live colonies. And we also bring in 500 new strains each year. So obviously we can't keep all those live. We have finite animal space, we have finite budgets and animal health concerns mandate that we can't just grow mice and hope someone buys them someday and then end up sacking a lot of mice. So we only keep live colonies where there's sufficient demand, which varies year to year, but it's something like five to 10 orders per year is needed to justify a small colony. And, and we review this constantly, um, which strains should stay on the shelf and which, which strains can go to cryo. And, you know, people are unhappy with the, the cost and the timeline, $3,000, 12 weeks. Um, and, you know, you probably get the same emails I do for five grand, we'll do CRISPR and give you a mouse. Well, you've got to realize that that's a founder mouse and you're going to have to do nine months of breeding before you can, you can do anything. So you're you're really not going getting behind by by getting a mouse out of cryo. And then the benefits of this, I want to emphasize, you know, we we do allele specific assays, we do SNP panels to verify genetic backgrounds, we scan for unwanted alleles like pre and neo and stuff like that. The mice that are recovered from cryo are tested with allele specific assay and they're at a high health status. And in some cases, like I said, we we have complex genotypes, so you can get a mouse with four alleles instead of buying four different mice and breeding them for, for three years. And, you know, I hear all the time, I'll just get some breeders, some guy down the hall. Well, I've heard so many horror stories about people aging a mouse for 18, a mouse for 18 months and then realizing it's it's got an unwanted neo or an unwanted Cree or it's actually on a mixed background or whatever. So um, just just be careful where you, where you get your, your mice. And um, we would greatly encourage you to use the repository. All right, on the phenotyping. This is our um, Indiana Jacks Pitt phenotyping pipeline. Primary screen is 4, 12, and sometimes 18 months, largely based on transcriptomics and proteomics. We are doing some biomarkers and neuropath. So those models that seem more most useful will then go on to the secondary screen, which is longitudinal up to 24 months, which includes imaging, biometrics, all the omics, um, biomarkers, neuropath. Some cases we'll, we'll do LTP and, and dendritic spine density. And we'll also do um, in vivo imaging, PET CT at 4, 12, 18, 24 months on, on distinct cohorts for those. And those, those um, image ligands will depend on the, the model itself. And then in some cases, we'll go out to 24 months and do um, cognitive assays, EGs, and um, touch screens. But we are, based on our own experience and based on what NIA is telling us, we are not focused on a lot of, of cognitive assays because we're much rather focusing on the, the quantitative translational assays that we're, we're, um, we're listening here. Oops, sorry. Um, just to mention, we are using biomarkers now, but we're always looking for new PET ligands and new biomarkers. And in our new um, renewal of the Model AD grant, we've added Jeff Dage, who was at Lilly and is now at Indiana, um, who is helping us develop new biomarkers. So we're, we're trying to keep current and um, even develop new biomarkers that, that are going to be useful both for, for human and mouse and translational work. Um, just one, one slide to mention that the touch screens, this is happening at Pitt under Stacy Rizzo's care. Um, Stacy is really excited because she recently got a, a grant for Marmoset. So instead of Model AD, it's Marmo AD. So, so she is literally doing, well, very, very closely doing the same assays in mouse, in Marmosets, and then these can be done in, in the can tab. So, so we think these are translational. And I know some of you know these are um, 
not easy, not straightforward, not quick, but um, we think these are the, the best way to go in terms of, of transla uh, translational cognitive assays. I should mention, we, we're also working with piloting the, um, the MoSeq system that Bob Datis developed at Harvard, and we're generating a lot of data from that, and we'll, we'll see how that works out. All right, so our primary screen from all these models is based on transcriptomics, and, and we developed, we worked with Nanostring to develop a um, transcriptomics panel based on the AMP-AD data. This is published, so I'm not gonna go into that, but um, essentially it's 770 genes that were prioritized by the AMP-AD system in the, in the clinical samples, and then we're um, very quickly and easily can, can um, quantify the expression of these genes. Initially, we started this sort of six years ago, we were looking for cost savings. The cost of RNA-seq has come down, so the costs are now relatively similar. But the big advantage of this is that you get the report spit out basically immediately, and you don't need a PhD to do the data analysis. Whereas with RNA-seq, we, we, we pay a lot of people a lot of money to, to do the data analysis. So I, I would recommend this. All right, so this is the first set of data on some of these primary screen models. Um, what we're showing here across the top is the, the AMP-AD human load modules. These are um, groups of genes that have been shown to be differentially regulated in patients versus controls. And these are broken up in different clusters, extracellular matrix, immune, neuronal, cell cycle, et cetera. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at where gene expression is different in human patients versus human controls. And then we're seeing how well the mouse models replicate that. So blue dots indicate, indicate strong correlation. That is the, the genes that are changed in the, in the mouse model are changing in the same direction as in the clinic, red is anti-correlated, so they go in the opposite direction. And we're doing this um, in age man age dependent manner. You can see at, in ABCA7, risk mutant, um, risk variant at four and eight months is actually anti-correlated. But by the time you get 12 months, there's strong correlation, especially in, in the immune cluster and then clusters D and E here. And we can now dr drill down and look at these specific genes and say that, for example, protein folding genes are, are differentially expressed. Um, with this risk variant. Likewise, with MTHFR, we don't see any, we actually see any correlation early, and then but by, by, by late ages, by 12 months, we see strong correlations, at least in some of these modules, and, li and likewise with a PLCG2 mutant. And these last two have actually been published already, um, and we've done some, some more deeper phenotyping at later ages, but this is how we, we prioritize for the, the first step. And then given this data, the RNA-seq data, we can then do gene set enrichment analysis. I won't go through it here, but we're, we're showing how these models compare to each other and compare to controls like 5 x fad And then this is just more um, drilling down on one specific age and model showing how we can, we can drill down and look at, you know, the immune cluster is differentially regulated and we see things like TREM2 and CSF1 um, and CD74, which, which we, um, give us some confidence that we're, we're moving in the right direction. So um, Alzheimer's is a complex disease and we're just starting, we as a field are just starting to understand how patients differ from each other. And the MPAD system and um, showing like in A here, the ROS map has basically um, stratified populations based on an inflammatory versus non-inflammatory subtype. And then we, we looked, again, looking in the transcriptomics, we looked and we see which of our models are similar to the inflammatory subtype versus the non-inflammatory subtype. We're actually seeing that certain models correlate to, to type A, the ABCA7 correlates to type A, whereas MTMR4 correlates to type B. All right, so this is a, admittedly a very crude first pass. Maybe there's a dozen different um, patient types this is very crude, you know, A and B, but we're seeing that the different mouse models can model different subtypes of patient population. So our goal here is to use human data to guide how to combine alleles, create models that match multi-omic signatures of human AD subtypes in their pathologies, and then optimize the models for testing target therapeutics. So we're not trying to get a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. We're trying to get five, 10, 20, who knows, different mouse models that can model different subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, shift, shift gears a little bit here and talk about some environmental uh, risk factors. Here we're looking at high fat diet. These are on um, low two mice, which is APOE4 and TREM. 
excuse me, load one, APOE4 and TREM, and load two, which has APOE4, TREM2, R47, H, and humanized A beta. Um, as you're aware, but you probably don't think about it every day, most mice are on a very healthy diet, vegan, um, low fat, and I don't know about you, but I am not on that type of diet. So we, we figured we have a more, more human-like diet um, to increase environmental risk on these genetic models. And as you'd expect, high-fat diet mice shown in the, the filled circles um, have greater weight. What's interesting here, looking on the right side, insoluble A beta 42, um, these scales are different, by the way. Um, the low two mouse high fat diet versus control chow high fat diet has much much higher levels of insoluble beta forty two, and those are with a the load one mice with without the humanized a beta don't have any a beta, insoluble a beta forty two at all, so we see an increase with the humanized a beta with a high fat diet. We looked at some biomarkers. Looking in the far right here is the the low two mice with the a beta and with a high fat diet. In each case, you can see whether it's um, NFL in CSF or plasma or TNF-alpha, we see significant increases in these um, biomarkers when you have the humanized A-beta and the high-fat diet. Um, we've started to do a lot of cell counts, and by uh, 18 months, we actually see, at least in females, um, in the cortex, we're seeing some indication that we're actually seeing neural cell loss, um, again, with, with high-fat diet, not without high-fat diet. And uh, similar transcriptomics, we're, we're looking at the Emory consensus models using proteomics. And again, we're seeing with the A-beta and with the high-fat diet, we're seeing much more um, correlation to the human condition. So just to summarize that, by 12 months of age, A-beta, A A-B4 mice have increased A-soluble A-beta, increased biomarkers, increased NFL, and, and um, Paul Torito shown neurovascular uncoupling. And by 18 months, we see um, proteomics signatures that, that match um, clinic. And important to point out, those on the control diet do not exhibit any of those effects. So we hope that a combination of aging, genetic risk factors, and high-fat diet may be a translational model late on set AD. This model may be useful to evaluate potential prophylactic therapeutic approaches at early stages of, of amyloid deposition. So these don't have amyloid pathology, don't have top pathology. I'm not saying this is a model of AD. I'm saying this is a model of very early stage AD, which is probably where we need to, to test our therapies. And we're continuing to develop this, obviously. We're also looking at other environmental factors. Um, we're, we have a pilot study right now running with heavy metals. Um, colleagues in Indiana are looking at ozone. Um, Mike Koob's looking at, at traumatic brain injury, and, and we're, we're hoping to collaborate to look at disruptive sleep as well. So, all right, let's talk about the town models. These are made by Mike Koob at University of Minnesota. Um, he's dropped in either 190 kb of the H1 haplotype or um, 23 kb of, of the H1 with 167 kb of H2 haplotype in place of the mouse locus. All right, so this includes the the, the humanized the humanized tau gene as well as the the, the MAPT AS1. Um, and the the difference here between H1 and H2 is this. Um, and there's a shared region there, which is a recombination junction. Um, and he has done uh, the transcriptome analysis and shown that the compute, complete human genomic sequence is expressed. Um, and in terms of protein, we're seeing normal levels of protein expressed in the human protein expressed in the mouse model. Okay, so that's that's important to show. In terms of the splicing, we, he's shown um, relatively similar levels of 3R and 4R in the humanized mouse model, whereas we don't see that in the, the normal mouse. And he's confirmed that all the, the tau splice isoforms are generated in expected ratios, um, similar to 50-50. So currently, we have wild-type H2 haplotype, wild-type H1 haplotype, and then the H1 haplotype with N279K, P301L, and uh, the 10 IV at the intervening se sequence. Um, we do not yet have the H1 haplotype scaled up. When we do, we're going to CRISPR in the R46W and the S320F um, variants into that H1 in combination with humanized A beta and humanized A44. So, this is an example of 
I'm saying we're going to have these models, but we don't even have the mouse to CRISPR into yet. So we're whatever, 18, 24 months away from having these mice available. We're also interested in other tau variants. We've talked to various foundations and various labs about other, and pharma's actually about other risk variants they're interested in, and, and we'd be happy to hear feedback. Um, there seems to be coming consensus that A152T would also be valuable, but um, we're still evaluating it. Um, separately, we have a new R01 with, with MyCube, and the goal is to create pairs of fully humanized loci, which is 230 kilobases, and each pair will have the wild type as well as a risk variant. And then we at JAX will be funded to age the cohorts to 12 months and do some omics and, and neural path. So for example, the MS4A is not a well-conserved locus between mouse and human. We will humanize that locus and then have the wild type locus as well as the, the humanized locus with the MS4A risk variants in that locus. And then we'll see by comparing those two strains to each other, we'll see what the risk variants are doing. Right, so you, you can't really study this in a, in a mouse. You can't if you put in just the risk variant, you wouldn't know what the difference if it was due to the risk or variant or due to the the mouse versus human comparison. So in each case, we're doing a uh, um, a come a pair and then comparing them pair to each other, and then the promising alleles would then be added into combinations for for the future model AD projects. This is still early days, but he, he's got some of these um, coming along, and they should be available in the next year or two. So then just to summarize here, um, we're focusing on humanized genes. We're focusing on risk variants. We're putting in these, these we're putting the risk variants in these platform strains and uh, emphasize what we're focusing on now is humanized A4, humanized A beta, humanized tau with H1 haplotype. Then we're going to introduce other AD risk variants either by mating the models together or CRISPRing directly into this low three model. Uh, as I said, I won't have time to talk about it. We are looking at both collaborative cross and wild derived backgrounds, and we actually have some posters at ADPD addressing that. And we're looking at, again, focus on extreme ages and focusing on um, environmental risks. I, I didn't say I should have mentioned um, those transcriptome analysis we're doing. Obviously, those are live mice that we're, ha we're harvesting at, at 12 and 24 months. Just as obviously, we're comparing those to clinical samples, which are literally terminal stage. So we would not expect expect that um, transcriptome analysis in the mouse to, to exactly mouse match the human because human are literally terminal. Um, generally, they're 80 or 90 year old people, whereas we're looking at mice that are much younger. So we're, we're happy that we can see the, the correlation that we have seen to date. But as I said, we are, we are aging mice further out. Uh, I talked about clinically relevant measures. Those measures will then be used for preclinical testing to match models to disease subtype, match the right models to the right drug, um, to find the therapeutic window, and, and to find the appropriate readouts. So um, these models, these data sets are available to you today. I just want to give you a very brief overview on how to access those. We do have a website for model AD, model ad.org. Um, and that has in the bottom right, that has links to some of these other resources I'll, I'll tell you about right now. One of those links is to a JAX search for just the um, model AD mice. You can, so in the JAX interface, you can go in and search for those and then search for your gene or, or whatever else you're interested in. So this is the fastest way to, to get a mouse you know you're interested in. AD Knowledge Portal, which is um, developed by Sage Bio Networks in Seattle, has these. Um, cards display for studies, publications, experimental models, computational tools, um, target enabling resources. So you can go in and look at a, all of our, our data that has been submitted is broken up into studies of best that study, microbiome study, et cetera. Um, so you can go in and drill down based on a study or based on a publication or based on a model. Um, and I should point out the AD Knowledge Portal is a work in progress, both in terms of we are continually um, downloading data, but it's also the functionality is being um, improved on a daily basis. So um, if you come into the experimental models, you can look by the, the card format, or there is a table where you can drill down and, and find links to get more data or, or link to the, the resources. 
Separately, Sage Bionetics has, has created this model AD Explorer, which is an interactive interface to, to um, customize the, the data you're looking at. And this is currently is, is pathology and gene expression, the correlations based on omics, the human disease. Um, we are planning on downloading other data set, uh, other types of data, and we continue to add new data sets as we go. So there's a, an interface here just to look for models. Um, and here's an example. I showed you data like this before. This is, you can go in and pick a, pick a mouse model and then see how this looks. And as I mentioned before, if, if you want to use this model in a grant, you can go to our website, go to this Model AD Explorer website, download this data, take a screenshot of it, put it in your grant and say, this proves that the, the ABCA mutant has whatever, um, characteristics you, you care to, to study, and that would be a, a considered preliminary data for your grant. There's also a way to go in and, you know, if you're not interested in model, you're interested in the INPP5D gene, you go in and, and say which models, in which ages, in which sexes, is this upregulated, downregulated, and again, you can um, save the data, save the plot, and that could be pilot data for your grant. So you can go in by the model or go in by the gene of interest and see which, which model has disrupted or altered uh, gene expression in, for the gene or pathway of interest. All right, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the preclinical testing core, um, which is kind of the, the last stage of, the, of, of our process anyway. And I, I'm, I've learned a lot about this the past five years. Um, to, to do a real useful preclinical testing study, you need to have the right target, the right drug, the right biomarker. And so we're always talking about how do we match the, the drug mechanism, right? If you want to look at a base inhibitor, it makes sense to use a 5X FAD model and you're, you're going to study A beta, you're going to look at A beta in CSF and plasma, you're going to use AB45 for PET CT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, if you're using a tau inhibitor, you need a model with, with tau pathology. You want to look at these biomarkers for tau, you want an image with AB1451, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, really the way we need to go about designing preclinical studies in the future. So often I think people just grab a, a transgenic model with amyloid and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my study, but not really understanding um, which phenotypes, which ages, um, and which readouts they should be using. So the, the preclinical testing core, which is largely at Indiana and Pitt, as well as here at JAX, um, has this elaborate um, go-no-go -no -go system, which I, I won't go through. But um, there are steps to to um, to get down to um, functional assays, omics, validation, and imaging. And why I think this is important for you to know is that there's this stop AD compound submission portal. So we are funded to test drugs in our models, and we are agnostic as to what drugs we're testing. So right now we've we've taken things we can get access to, educanumab, verabestostat, levetiracetam. Um, if you have a suggestion for a drug that you think will be efficacious in Alzheimer's, we you need to have sufficient preliminary data, but you can basically apply to this program. We'll review the data, we'll review it with NI program officers, and we can do the basically do the drug study in our models in our hands for you, with you, um, the only, and we're paying for that, the u for our grant is paying for that. The only stipulation is that because it's funded by NIH, the data that we produce must be shared. And that's a deal killer for some, some farmers. But certainly any academic who is interested in doing a, um, a preclinical testing uh, study, we'd love to work with you on that. And along those lines, we have a course every May, this year it's May 8th to 12th, called Principles and Techniques for Improving Preclinical clinical Translation AD Research. This is largely led by the, the Model AD staff, but we also bring in um, guest speakers. And it's a really fascinating course. It's a one week, very intensive. Um, most of the class lives in this mansion here on, uh, on the ocean, which is about a mile from the lab. And the mornings are largely lectures, discussions, afternoons, largely hands-on workshops in our training lab. 
and then we have dinner together and we have discussions um, after dinner. So it's it's very intensive. There's lots of interaction with the with the faculty and with each other. We've had some good correlations come out out of this course, whether it's between students in the course or um, with between model AD staff and, and students in the course. And the students are generally advanced grad students, postdocs. We do have some um, early stage investigators who are academically trained, but would like to get into to doing preclinical research. So um, it may be late for this year, but I'd encourage you or your students to, to think about this. Um, and there's lots more information online. So just to summarize this part of it, you know, Model AD kind of sits here in the middle of the, the NIH um, and the trans, translational pipeline, they're calling it. They have uh, a lot of different programs upstream. We're looking at, at human condition, translational centers for new medicines. We're trying to be in the middle generating models for these, these different types of diseases, which can then be used for the STOP AD portal and um, downstream in the, these translational medicine centers. So let me just check the time. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through some other programs. Um, we are making models for the Neuroimmune Consortium. Hopefully, you've seen this SPP1 paper from, from Seppe and Soyun Hung's lab. Um, we're excited to be part of that and, and hopefully continue to work with them in the future. But we've, we've got a batch of reporters and cream mice that are specific for microglial subtypes. All right, so we, we no longer talk about activated microglia. We talk about the 12 different or 20 different, depending on which single cell study you're looking at. But we're looking at these and, and trying to understand how very specific microglia function, specific microglial states function, just as, um, as this paper did for the SPP1. With Shane Littlelow, we're making some astrocyte reporters. And we're also focusing on APOE models. Um, we've, we've made... Christchurch and APOE3 and APOE4. We made Jacksonville and APOE3, and we're, we will be making Jacksonville mutation APOE4. We made an APOE Cree dependent GFP reporter. And um, you know, there's these inducible models. The Holtzman lab and the Boo lab have Cree inducible transgenic models that you can turn on or off a uh, humanized APOE. What we're making here is a the top one, humanized APOE4, it's constitutively expressing humanized APOE4 until you hit it with a Cree uh, and tamoxifen, and then you can switch to APOE4 to APOE3 in a specific cell type. So for example, you can just have APOE3 expressed in astrocytes, whereas APOE4 continues to be expressed in, in neurons and microglia. So we've got the four to three swap, we've got a three to four swap reciprocal, and we've got a three to two swap. And um, Lance Johnson at University of Kentucky has made the APOE4 to two swap, um, unbeknownst to us, but we, we've talked to him recently, and he's willing to, he will be sharing that with Jack. So we will also have the APOE4, the APOE2 um, conditional inversion model available. So these, I think there's lots of opportunities here. We will be doing the uh, constitutive Cree to show that the model does what it's supposed to do. We were not funded. We probably don't have the time and hands to do the cell type specific um, swaps. And I was, assume people want to cross these two amyloid and tau models. So there's, there's lots of opportunity there to play with those. And I'd encourage you to pick those up. Like I said, we're going to prove they work and then hand those off to the community and let other people run with them. Uh, we recently got a grant with the Alzheimer's Association to cross the uh, Swedish Octogostrian APP knock-in to the, the Kube tau N279K. Um, so presumably that we know this as amyloid, presumably it's a lot of tau pathology. And we're crossing it to APOE 234 series to see how that impacts the amyloid and tau pathology. We're also crossing that to the, the Christchurch and Jacksonville variants um, to see how the how APOE 4 Christchurch is different than APOE, APOE 4 on its own. So, and these will be again aging up at least 18 months, amyloid tau pathology, clinical chemistry, biomarkers, omics, and we'll be doing some um, motion sequencing with Bob data. So uh, just quickly, we've made, um, we work with Denali Therapeutics to make the Swedish Arctic and Austrian knockout that is published. I'm not going to go through this. We've got a lot of data on the amyloid um, deposition with time um, with some cool technologies. But we also have now have that Swedish Arctic and Austrian model on the WSB and PWK backgrounds. We're seeing very different phenotypes um, 
as as Gareth Howell's lab here at Jax has already published um, WSB and PWK with a transgenic APP show very different phenotypes. They're very different microglial response to amyloid. Um, we're seeing that, and we're 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 thinking with pilot data. We're thinking that some of these will be good models of CAA as opposed to parenchymal amyloid. We've also created a Swedish Dutch Iowa model knock-in model, which we expect will have CAA based on previous work with the transgenic SDI combination. And these both, the SA and SDI have internal mutations. So there's some, some concern that the A-beta 42 fragment isn't the same as it is in, in most patients. So we've made the, the Swedish Florida London combination. So there's no mutations within the 1 to 42 region. Um, this is similar to the 5X fat model, except it's a knock-in. Um, so these are all, we're actually, for the bottom half here, we're, we're dropping cohorts this month and we'll start aging those, but we have not characterized these, but these will be available in the summer. I mentioned I'll going to ADPD next week. We've got six or eight people from Model AD will be there. Please stop in. We've got a bunch of posters. I'm happy to talk to you there if, if you're interested. Um, I passed the thousands to thank um, between Indiana, UC Irvine, Sage, um, University of Pittsburgh and Jackson Lab. And please email me if you have questions. Um, thanks to our collaborators here at JAX and at other sites. And thanks for funding the Denali Anonymous Foundation, National Institute Aging, and the Alzheimer's Association. And finally, I'd like to point out we are recruiting PhD level staff. And this is the Jackson Lab. This is Acadia National Park. And this is the Atlantic Ocean. So it's a beautiful place to work and a beautiful place to live. And I encourage you to uh, get in touch with me if you're interested. And I will stop there and take questions. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Mike. We have so many questions after that amazing talk. So I'm just going to start up and start reading them out. So the first question we have is from Joshua um, Emerson. So he's just wondering about the use of rats in the Model AD program, given that there's already been some transgenic rats, kind of particularly those out of McGill that have been developed. Do you have any comment on that? Um, yeah, so we, in this case, we as Indiana and Bruce Lamb's group have done some studies with the transgenic rats. Um, we did a, a year or two study early on. Um, I think they're knocking rats, which I would, I would advocate more than the transgenic rats, but we are not, um, obviously we have our hands full with the, the models we're, we're doing in mice. And actually Jax is a, is not a rat, rat house, it's a mouse house. So we, we would not have rats here ever. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would encourage other people to use that. I know there's some commercial available knocking rats now, but, but that is not something we're focused on. Great. Thanks. Um, a question now from Marco, um, uh, Prado, and I think, is that Marco from the, from the Western? He's got a, a question about the cognitive, um, behavior tests, um, and why, um, you kind of the test that the ch task, uh, choice that Stacy and the consortium have made, um, questioning why not use attentional tasks because in their hands, they're feeling that they, they have, um, really strong attentional deficits in, uh, the AD lines they're working with, uh, mouse lines. Yeah. Um, uh, first off, I defer to Stacy in all things behavior, but um, attention is difficult because a lot of these AD mouse models, and I think rats too, have hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to distinguish attention deficits from just they're not slowing down long enough to, <laughs> to do the task. So I, again, this is not my field expertise, but it, it's a very complex area when you, when you talk about attention. Um, and again, I would, you know, I'm happy to forward questions, Stacey Rizzo, but I'm, I'm not qualified for those. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, a, a question from Anesh Sill. So um, her question is about the plans to model environmental pollutants in the models, which I think you just touched on. Maybe you could just um, expand on that a little. So like I said, we're doing pilots in, with um, cadmium lead mercury, um, which is essentially putting them in the water. Um, there are projects going on in Indiana where they're actually having cages with ozone for a specific, you know, not 24 hours, but exposure to ozone, and then comparing how those uh, impact a model that's prone to AD, like a humanized A-beta or, or whatever else. So, um, you know, we <laughs> the mouse field is great at having very consistent mouse models, but it's not great at modeling what's actually happening to human, you know, giving every mouse a, a vegan low fat diet 
you know, that's that's not modeling what's happening in humans. So I think we need to, to open our horizons a little bit and and do other things, um, whether it's ozone or, or uh, heavy metals or, mm -hmm. or like I showed, I mean, we're really excited about the high fat diet, diet stuff. And <laughs> that's very human relevant <laughs> yeah and very striking data as well yeah. so yeah no, it was really great to see that today um next question is from sarah nicholas so super interesting presentation have you any plans or are you looking at the the gut uh, microbiome composition i guess thinking kind of of the recent paper from david holzman's lab looking at that kind of really key work yeah um we we did that we did a pilot study for a year or so and um, those are really, you have to really, we, we try to just basically just take samples from existing cohorts and we learned that's not the way to do it. You, you really need to have individually housed mice. And I think we will go back to that at some point based on papers that have been published since then. Um, I think it's Sam Studios group that's, that's shown that ApoE4 is, is relevant or a, a, the ApoE variant is, is relevant for those type of studies. But, um, Honestly, when we did it, we we saw more cage to cage variability than genotype or age variability. So it so you generate a ton of data, but it's it's hard to know what to do with it. Okay. So I, I think we will be coming back to those with with better experimental designs um, based on what we learned from that pilot. But it's, it's not a focus for us right now. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, a question from um, Kathy Fernandez. Uh, she's very interested in the data on the high fat data diet giving um given ad lab feeding probably isn't that healthy either um have you looked at the effect of food restriction in any of your models and i guess also maybe with the touchscreen testing as well as a food restriction i mean because we're doing touchscreen testing and the food restriction is an element was, to do I the work say, we, we didn't do that consciously we did that inadvertently and we saw really interesting things so the biomarkers when you do the um food restriction prior to the, the touchscreen testing the biomarkers drop off significantly in a matter of weeks so yeah that is a uh, it's an interesting variable it's also an experimental confound so it's it's hard to know how to, to deal with that and we're honestly we're struggling with those those aspects right now yeah yeah that's um, a great question yeah yeah well, thanks um we have a um a question from luke here katsuro um here at ecl so amazing presentation can you elaborate on the different mouse genetic backgrounds that you're using um kind of in terms of P6J and versus the other backgrounds. I guess you didn't, I mean, I'm kind of aware of the data, but um, I guess you didn't touch on it today so much. Yeah, at all. yeah, yeah. just uh, lack of time. Um, yeah, of course. I've got some papers out. Um, I'd encourage you to look at, at Gareth Howell's publications and Catherine Kazarowski's, um, both of Jack's. Um, we are doing two separate approaches. One is we're putting APP alleles on CC lines. So it's basically a, a gene survey seeing which in the diverse complex um, CC lines, we're trying to see which backgrounds are more conducive to amyloid pathology. And actually it's interesting because we look at pathology, sometimes we're seeing differences in not levels of, of amyloid, but we're seeing it going moving from parenchyma to vasculature. So it's something about the different microglia and the different backgrounds that are um, causing that switch. So we're looking at CC lines, but we're also looking at, um, as I said, just said briefly, PWK um, and WSB seem to be very different in terms of, and again, Gareth's group has published a, a survey of eight different um, inbred lines, and they've then focused on those two because they, the microglia react very differently. And therefore, you know, you can imagine a basic allelic series of, of mice where some mice are more prone to, um, Neuroinflammation, some mice are less prone to neuroinflammation, and then that would obviously impact your, your Alzheimer's phenotype. So um, there's much work to be done there, but I think it's a, a very fertile area. Um, great. Thanks so much. And just to let everyone know, I, I do know that there are questions in the chat as well as in the Q&A, so I'm just going to get to those now. Um, okay, for those of you who are posting in both. Um, so I have a question now uh, from Karen Duff. So do the model AD mice show as much variability um, as each other? Um, so even highly inbred mice, especially in pathology, and what are you doing to kind of reduce that variability that you're seeing in some of your outcome measures? Um, you know, the obvious uh, being really careful with experimental conditions, but, but mostly we're just being very careful to track on an individual mouse basis. And what we're, we're focusing on is where we're doing um, biomarkers longitudinally, then at the end of the 
12 or 24 months when we harvest those mice, we'll, we'll match up the specific individual mouse across, across those different assays and, and see if there's something going on there. But um, yeah, you know, there are cage, cage effects based on in, inflammation or microbiome or whatever that you're never gonna completely get rid of. And, you know, you could argue that's a good thing because people aren't all the same either, so. <laughs> Okay, so we've got uh, another question um, out of UCL from so from Dervis AI. So excellent work. Uh, he's got two questions. So first of all, is there any plans to study the effects of infection in any of the AD uh, mouse models that you're working on from the Model AD Consortium? Um, we are not, but we are providing mice to um, some labs that are seeking funding right now to do do exactly that. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that isn't in our hand. And actually, Jax strongly frowns on human infection agents being, being a Jax. Um, but we are collaborating with people and providing mice to, for people on the outside who are, who are doing that. Um, and he just also queries about uh, what changes you're seeing in the blood brain barrier um, in any of the core models and how you're kind of measuring those BBB uh, dysfunctions. What kind of. Um, to date, we're mostly just doing neuropath, but we, we are very interested in that, and we are starting to move more toward um, more imaging. Actually, Paul Torito at Indiana has shown um, uncoupling of, of glucose utilization and blood flow and things like that. So there are, mm -hmm. there are um, in vivo assays that we're, we can use to address those questions. But um, uh, also, I didn't get to talk about but that the tissue vision system that we're imaging amyloid and vasculature together and then we we get a library of of, of slides um that's behind me and 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 then we can we can stain for um fibrin and leakage and things like that so th those are in progress yeah. yeah great thanks sorry so many questions mike um okay. next question from jackie nemo regarding the plan map t mice um she's interested in the choice of the mutations uh i I think and why I think it's the P301S. It's I think it's clipped her, her question why that wasn't chosen. Why were the why the went for the mutation that was chosen? Um first, first priority was getting variants in different um exons, different parts of the tau, tau gene. Um, we didn't want a bunch lined up in one exon. We wanted to to, to vary those. Second priority was um the, the risk in human populations and the frequency in human populations. So we would much rather model a, something in 1% of the population than something in 0.01% of the population. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you can make a good case for a lot of these different different variants. And like I said, we're we're open to, to adding others to the list if, if people have good, good reasons for it. And they think they'll be used, yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Um, I think we just got time for one last question. I hope you can squeeze it in, Mike. Um, so for the high fat diet, question from Damien Cunnings, how um how high was the high fat and how long for? Um it's really gross. Um, <laughs> I I think it was 45% fat, so it's kind of greasy, slimy. Um we did some starting at two months, going to 12 months, but more recently we're doing shorter term and we're still seeing strong effects. So we're still kind of working out those those variables, but um I would I would say that yeah, a three month um, regimen would would be sufficient. They don't need to be started early in, in life. Okay, um, I'm just saying for us, I think, but I don't want to know what it is. Okay. <laughs> um, last question um, from Shireen uh, Nizari, which is given the the involvement of this uh, cerebral vasculature um, and its importance, have you got a plan to kind of tackle that specifically or model that? Uh, kind of, I guess, the endothelial component or some specific um, plans in that area? Um, I mentioned the, uh, the, the models we expect will have CAA. Um, so that's that's ongoing. Separate from model AD, we are within the neuro and, uh, neuroimmune consortium. We're making some models to, to label cerebrovasculature and try to get at the, the, the cell type specific states. Um, the change with with age or disease mm -hmm. in the vasculature. So that is uh, again, that's an area that we need a lot more, a lot more study, a lot more models, a lot more, a little more effort in that area because that it's it's essential. And we, I feel like we've only just 
started focusing on that the past year or two. So that that is definitely a, a great area. If, you, if I were a student, I would be working in that right now. Thank you so much. So thank you for very much for your amazing talk. We have lots of claps coming up. Um, that was and for answering all those many many questions. Obviously, uh, um, brought a look, kind of a lot of huge interest within the institute and, and wider field. So thank you so much for your time, Mike. Um, and just to remind everyone, this webinar has been recorded and will be on the portal in due course. So you can, if anyone who can't uh, attend couldn't attend today, uh, do let them know that they'll be able to listen to this great talk. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for the interest. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.